as the Democrats have their national convention with a whole slew of speakers via Zoom for the most part or specially pre-produced segments on camera. Yeah, John Kasich, who we'll get to in this segment, we'll talk about him, former governor of Ohio, Republican, literally standing at a crossroads. You have Bernie Sanders, that same evening speaking, of course, avowed democratic socialist, whatever democratic means. You have Jill Biden who spoke, Dr. Jill Biden, Michelle Obama as well. So many different speakers trying to rev up the base in a socially distanced way. What are we to make of the convention and some of the other news of the day? Let's talk about it. Dive right in with senior writer at The National Review, David Harsani, who rejoins us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. David, sir, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Thanks it. for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time today. So let me jump in and then I'll play a couple of sound bits for you as well. But what is your sense so far? We're getting ready for day three of the DNC for how things are going, especially with a socially distanced convention. Well, I mean, I don't think it's great. <laughs> it's not very compelling television. It's really not much they can do about it. I thought, you know, there were certain aspects that weren't terrible. The roll call, having people, you know, in their states and, you know, you, you saw the uniqueness of all these places. I thought that was somewhat interesting. But I think that the speeches themselves fall flat because, you know, they're quite platitudinous, but also because that is, you know, amplified by the lack of a crowd, by the lack of cheering and things like that. So I, I found most of the the speeches uh, wanting, I would say, I'd probably give as far, not as far as content goes, but as far as delivery goes, uh, Michelle Obama, the highest marks of, of all the, all the folks who've spoken. Yeah. David Arsani, in fact, let's pull up a video that we have clip it two of Michelle Obama. I agree with you that the, the, the lack of theatrics really does make a big difference in terms of how these politicians come across, how anybody comes across when you're giving a speech. It's the difference between you and I, for example, having a conversation, me giving a monologue here on Jimmy at the Crossroads versus a live audience of people who are cheering and, and being able to react. But here's a clip of Michelle Obama on Monday night. So let me be as honest and clear as I possibly can. Donald Trump is the wrong president for our country. He has had more than enough time to prove that he can do the job, but he is clearly in over his head. He cannot meet this moment. He simply cannot be who we need him to be for us. It is what it is. Now, I understand that my message won't be heard by some people. We live in a nation that is deeply divided, and I am a black woman speaking at the Democratic Convention. But enough of you know me by now. You know that I tell you exactly what I'm feeling. You know I hate politics. But you also know that I care about this nation. So if you take one thing from my words tonight, it is this. If you think things cannot possibly get worse, trust me, they can and they will if we don't make a change in this election. If we have any hope of ending this chaos, we have got to vote for Joe Biden like our lives depend on it. So it is an existential election, David Harsani. She certainly knows how to appeal to an audience in any sort of presentation setting, because that was a very effective address. Oh, yeah, she's she's good at what she does. Uh, she doesn't like politics. I think that that's probably true, um, but she's good at it. And uh, I, I mean, I think it was a bit I was it was off putting for me to hear her say, uh, you know, I'm a black woman. No one's you know, there are people who aren't going to listen to me. I mean, she has a massive, you know, uh, platform and, and, you know, to speak to the American people more than than most of us, for sure. And she's quite popular, so I don't know where, where she gets that or why she says that. It's I think, sort of unnecessary victimhood, but you know, and it's and, and, you know, it's a partisan speech. You don't really hear a former first lady the kind of partisan speech you wouldn't hear a former first lady really, uh, you know, 
involve themselves in typically, but you know, I think she was effective. She's certainly better than most of the people who, who yeah. spoke. So yeah, we'll see. Well, and one thing too that strikes me, David Harsani from the National Review, our guest, about her address is that she was able to bring a conversational style in a setting that it was really necessary. If you're in a room like that, you can't be giving some grand address like in front of a live audience, as I was talking about. But I also think it is interesting where you have the former first lady of the United States talk about how some people will not listen to her because of her race and her gender. She was in that office of first lady because her husband, a black man in America, was elected and then reelected. So I don't see how that flies other than an identity politics play, perhaps the Democratic base. Yeah, I think I think that the base, you know, right now we, we have we're having a, supposedly having a racial reckoning. So I'm sure that that sort of rhetoric works. Yeah. Um, you know, to the first, to your first point, I think that the, during the Zoom convention, and maybe Republicans should think about this or take note. I think normal people who speak in a normal cadence in a normal way uh, come off a lot more sincere and real. And when I say normal, I mean you know everyday Americans who speak it, it, better than the sort of dramatic pausing and the canned lines and the things that work to a big audience. Um, those to me were cringeworthy moments. Klobuchar, mm. I, I can remember her making a joke and that was just terrible. And so a few others like that, but Michelle had a much more sort of conversational mm -hmm. tone, as you mentioned. And, and, and I think that that worked and perhaps that was part of it. I think she's also, you know, it's just her personality and that I think, I think that she, she has compelling messages yes. in general, but I think that uh, the way she spoke had a lot to do with why she was affected. Yeah, oh, exactly. It was fact, also pre-taped, right? So that has something to do with it as well. She might have, yes. might have been 20 takes. We don't know, right? Yeah. Well, it, it is the case that both President, former President Obama and former First Lady Obama are compelling speakers by nature. They, they are able to talk and present in front of an audience, and they've also clearly been coached very well how to do it. So this was just a natural situation for them. What was more awkward, and I say this as I'm— saying that I'm at the crossroads in a web show studio, but John Kasich, former Republican governor of Ohio, literally stood at a crossroads in his video. Let's go to cut four and take a look at this and then get your reaction, David Arsani. America is at a crossroads. Sometimes elections represent a real choice, a choice we make as individuals and as a nation about which path we want to take when we've come to challenging times. America is at that crossroads today. The stakes in this election are greater than any in modern times. I'm a lifelong Republican, but that attachment holds second place to my responsibility to my country. That's why I've chosen to appear at this convention. In normal times, something like this would probably never happen, but these are not normal times. I'm sure there are Republicans and independents who couldn't imagine crossing over to support a Democrat. They fear Joe may turn sharp left and leave them behind. I don't believe that because I know the measure of the man. It's reasonable, faithful, respectful. And you know, no one pushes Joe around. Joe Biden is a man for our times. Mm. Times that call for all of us to take off our partisan hats and put our nation first for ourselves and, of course, for our children. An effective video message from the Never Trump former Republican governor of Ohio, David Harsani? Now, I have to just preface this by saying that I don't feel like I'm a normal voter. So I, I, none of these speeches really speak to me at all, to be honest with you. I'm just trying to see it through the lens of a, of a voter. Sure. Um, I mean, that to me is just unbearably stupid. I mean, it was just a bunch of gibberish. Uh, and the idea that Joe Biden wouldn't turn uh, hard left is is debunked by his very actions over the past few months. He's, he's essentially running far to the left of Barack Obama on any policy issue. You want to say that, um, you know, you like his tonally, you like him better, or you think he's going to be more respectful. That's fine. That's a fine argument. But the idea that on policy, he is not far to the left, that that's not true. And if you're going to make this be a binary choice, you're at a crossroads, right? Um, that, well, actually, that's not binary, but whatever, you know, he's making it a binary choice, the election, then, um, then we should talk about policy. I mean, basically, John Kasich is, is, is supporting a candidate who believes that abortion on demand 
uh, funded by the state is fine, that supports socializing medicine, that supports confiscation of guns, et cetera. I mean, uh, that kind of message I don't think will work for on Republicans who are watching it, though perhaps it makes folks on the Democratic side feel better or people on the you know, more moderates on the Democratic side feel better in some way. But I, I, I think his appeal is incredibly limited. Yeah, well, the the Democratic Party right now, as you identified, is so far to the left on countless issues and something that just absolutely contradicts what John Kasich has said. And many have pointed this out is the fact that Bernie Sanders spoke before the Democratic National Convention last night, David Harsani. I mean, how can you say with a straight face that Joe Biden is not going to bring us on a leftward trajectory? And then a little later, the socialist himself Two socialists actually last night spoke at the Democratic convention. You had both Bernie Sanders and the one who formally nominated Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the congresswoman from New York. All right. I'm not saying that the Democratic Party is going to be, you know, become socialist under Joe Biden. But I'm sure. saying that, uh, you know, well, for, first of all, I should say you you make a good point. You have a socialist who is spewing this Marxist rhetoric at a major national convention, and that's just normalized, and everyone, you know, pats Bernie on the head and says how important he is, because of course they have this view of history that the left will always continue to move left until they are socialists. We're just, you know, we're just not. People aren't ready to evolve yet. You know how how it is. But um, the, the that's bad enough. But just on policies that Biden supports. He is to the left of Barack Obama on every single issue. There's not a single issue someone can mention to me where he's not to the left of Barack Obama. And that's fine. Maybe that's where the Democratic Party is. But then I don't want to hear John Kasich telling me that this is such a simple choice. Uh, And then what really annoys me is when people do this on either side, um, they, they frame it as a patriotic choice. You know, he's voting for Biden because he is putting country above party. Well, you know, that's just, that's just a, you know, platitude and, 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 uh, it's kind of a cheap shot. So, you know, but I, I don't have much respect, respect for John Kasich and, and I don't think many Republicans do probably not even Republicans who are, who are uh, sort of just, torn about voting for, just for, for at, Donald Trump in the first place. Yeah. Your, your point's so well taken, particularly just look at how terribly John Kasich did in the Republican primary. And then also how terribly he would have done had he actually decided to, as he was thinking about and tossing out in the public, challenge Donald Trump for the Republican nomination. He knows he would have just, his clock would have been absolutely clean. He would have had no shot because Republicans don't have tolerance for this idea of of what John Kasich supposedly brings to the table. But tonight, David Arsani, again, our guest senior writer at the National Review, tonight Kamala Harris will be formally accepting in her own speech the nomination for Vice President of the United States as the Democratic nominee. And, you know, when she gives a prepared speech, she can give a pretty good speech. I think differently of when she's off the cuff. You saw some of those town halls that she did and how she comes across then. But what are you expecting from Kamala Harris tonight? And also, David, what do you make of the selection of Harris by Joe Biden to be VP? Well, you know, from my personal perspective, I think she's one of the worst picks possible. She's an authoritarian. That's her instinct in every way. It makes me laugh when leftists say to me or progressives say to me, you know, she's, uh, you know, you have this conflicting argument. You're saying she's pro-police, but you're also saying she's pro, you know, she's hard left. Well, yeah, those things comport com- completely. You have to be pro-police to be pro pro progressive because everything Kamala Harris wants to do and the hard left wants to do in America will take police and compelling efforts by the state to make happen. And that's perfect for her. Now, I don't think that she's some, you know, consistent ideologue. I mean, she changes, you know, she'll go, she'll say whatever she has to, but, but, but her, I think her natural, the inclination that she has is to use the state to force others to do the things that she wants. And uh, that's perfect for the time, I think. Um, as far as her appeal, I mean, you just mentioned Kasich and what a what a kind of small uh, con- constituency he had. I mean, she was not very popular either. What did she pull two percent or something like that? I don't really think that she's going to change the dynamics on the on the left, but I do think that she will excite people on the right 
a bit more, though I don't think it's, you know, game, game changing probably, but I think she'll excite them because on the right, you, you, you know, she, she is a, <laughs> she represents a lot of things that you can't, she gives sort of a, a, a better target onto the hard left, you know, trajectory of the, mm. of the democratic party than Joe Biden does, who doesn't really, you know, he does, he seems moderate, he's sort of aesthetically moderate, I guess you'd say, but, but, you know, policy wise not so yeah in terms of kamala harris i mean the the far left doesn't like her they think that she is not left-wing enough for them which shows where they are at politically right now but in terms of the republican base i mean i definitely think she's an energizing force and for moderates the thing that i would suggest that the uh, that the republican campaigns particularly president trump's have already identified and talking about is the inauthenticity of kamala harris that she's constantly looking for the next step in their very first campaign ad uh, against the selection of harris as vp nominee the trump campaign called her phony harris it was slow joe and phony harris and i think that phony harris I mean, maybe different language could be used but that principle of inauthenticity at this point in time i think can play pretty pretty well to those who were sort of on the fence who haven't made their decision, whereas for motivating the Republican base, playing up the left wing attitudes will help. Maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm not a political strategist. Honestly, I would, I would garner five votes if I ran for any kind of <laughs> office. But the thing is that uh, when you say someone is inauthentic, it makes it sound like they're moderate in a way, right, that they'll do whatever they need to do so that they can change. I think a better argument that or more an argument that would convince me is she's actually an ideologue, right? And she is hardcore and she's dangerous um, for me. And she's going to be the person driving policy because Joe Biden, um, and this is not just my position, I forgot what the poll said, but many Americans don't believe he's going to finish his term. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a possibility. He's called himself a transitional president, that she's the president in waiting, and she is far to the left even of Joe Biden, and that she's a serious threat. I mean, I would have a commercial for talking about how she will confiscate guns that she doesn't yes. like and how she will do it by circumventing Congress and just doing it through executive order. To me, that sort of thing is is more, you know, energizes gun owners and things like that more than just calling her a phony, because I think most most Americans realize that politicians are generally phony, right? Yeah. Then again, maybe it is effective. I'm sure they've done their research. But to me, I think when you're talking to real conservatives and the, you know, the kind of activist conservative that, uh, or what I should say, like the gun owner or the conservative who, who cares about that sort of thing, who might not vote, mm -hmm. if you really want, you know, to get to, to get them get them to do so, I think you have to, you know, I'm not saying scaremonger, but you have to give them some facts about about what might be happening once Joe Biden is in right. control of that. Especially state. right now on the Second Amendment, when people are really attuned to the idea of defending themselves when the police have been rendered neutered in many communities, they cannot just rely on local law enforcement. And I should also note, by the way, David Harsani, that you, of course, are author of the book First Freedom, A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. So you can understand uh, certainly right. where, you, where you're coming from, you bet, on, on the issue of the Second Amendment, our constitutional protected right to keep and bear arms. But I, I absolutely agree that I think that that's a, a very potent point. Just a final question, because we're running out of time here with you, David Arsani. Um, I just saw a piece, your most recent piece yesterday uh, about the Lincoln Project, which, of course, is this never Trump so-called Republican group and what they're doing going after Marco Rubio. Can you tell us what they're up to at this point is they're not just targeting President Trump, but basically any Republican across the country now? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, I don't, it, politics, right? So sharp elbows, all that. And I don't really care about the Lincoln Project very much. I, I mean, if they want to take down Trump, that's fine. What, what annoys me about them mildly is that they uh, misrepresent themselves. You know, they want to take down the entire Republican Party, people who even moderates like Susan Collins and others. So essentially, they're just the Democratic front group. They're not Republican in any way. You can't call yourself a Republican when you literally do not support a single Republican cause. I mean, you can call yourself whatever you want, but we don't have to accept that. And yesterday, of course, one of their main, you know, one of the main characters over there basically smeared Marco Rubio and said that he would never have escaped Cuba. He would have been the type who, I forget how, what the phrasing was, you know, he would have been the type who was a communist and who would have, uh, you know, done these horrible things. And meanwhile, I, I'm not a big Marco Rubio fan for a bunch of reasons, but the guy has been consistently 
and quite loudly anti-China and, uh, you know, the Chinese communist government for years. And in fact, they, I think he's banned from going to China or something like that by the government there. It's just a despicable kind of um, ad hominem attack that's very hard to defend against. And, you know, that's their brand now. So I just thought I'd, I'd point out how unfair it was. I, you know, I don't, I don't think it's something that's going to matter very much as far as the election goes. But I do think that it's, you know, if you're going to, if your big argument in, about Donald Trump is that his manners are, are, you know, terrible and he says terrible things, and you act worse than he does, I'm not sure that your argument really carries much weight yeah. anymore. And here's here's one of the lines. Talking about Rubio, Steve Schmidt, again, one of the leaders of this Lincoln project, said he is the type of man who would glad who would have gladly held Castro's coat if it helped him rise just a little. It is truly despicable rhetoric, and they are sinking low to new lows in this Democrat front group. I agree with you in terms of what the Lincoln project really is. They had this hashtag, hashtag Lincoln voter that was trending, nonsensical, <laughs> especially because Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. And certainly, even if he opposed one Republican, he wouldn't oppose all Republicans. David Arsani, senior writer at the National Review, and once again, author of First Freedom. Check it out, a book on the constitutionally protected right to keep and bear arms. Thanks so much for joining us today here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Good to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, David Harsani from The National Review. Full title of his book, First Freedom, A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. Thanks for watching this clip of Jimmy at the Crossroads. Don't miss more engaging, intelligent talk. Subscribe today to the Jimmy at the Crossroads YouTube channel. You do not want to miss our live show. Thanks for your support. I got Jimmy at the Crossroads Making sense out of no one No sense Yeah! <laughs>